Hello, welcome to The Doctor is In with Dr. Frank Spidell. I'm Rick Anthony. Uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that one in 59 children have autism spectrum disorder, or ASD. According to one U.S. survey, the numbers are even higher. One in 40 children, not 59, or one and a half million of those between the ages of three and 17 have autism spectrum disorder. Boys are four times more likely to have the disorder than girls. Most children are still being diagnosed at the age of four, though autism can be reliably diagnosed as early as two. In fact, that's when we learned that one of our grandchildren had autism spectrum. Yet in spite of the numbers of children and adults who are on the autism spectrum, we know very little about what causes autism or how to prevent it. Nor as a society have we come to grips on how to support people with autism to develop to their full potential. Many have very special gifts that enrich the lives of many. Why then are 90% of adults with autism unemployed or underemployed? For years, a debate has raged about whether vaccinations, specifically the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella. That's the subject of today's session with Dr. Frank Spidel, author, speaker, with over 30 years of experience in emergency medicine and hospital administration. Doctor, always a pleasure to see you. Always a pleasure. Vince. This, Happy by the way, is uh, your inaugural show. You're going to be doing yes, a is. series here at Roger Studio 21 on a number of subjects that I think uh, mystify most people. Uh, but since all of us are being encouraged to be more responsible for our own health, I think it's been fabulous that you're going to be providing information that will be useful to people to be more responsible for themselves. Uh, let's begin with the definition of uh, autism. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, we have experience with it. I know how difficult it is to deal with it. I also appreciate how much progress has been made in the past several years. But what is the official definition of autism, please? Well, it's kind of fun to go back and look at this historically. I don't know if you've heard me monologue about this, Vince, but in my library at home I have books from way back when I started in medicine. And the other day I just started picking a book off the shelf to see when I could find the first pediatric textbook reference to autism. Uh, obviously it was not going to be in my old Nelson's textbook of pediatrics, copyright 1973. Uh, the most recent one before I found it was a 1991 text, but uh, then in 1994 I found a, about a half page on autism in a pediatric textbook. And I thought it was interesting to read that and then see how much our perceptions have changed. Uh, they kind of got it right and they kind of got it wrong. Uh, initially they talked in the, the 94 text, they, they talked about uh, the child with autism is going to have impaired communication, impaired social interaction, and uh, some restricted confined activities and behaviors. Uh, they said a number that sounds still good today, uh, three to one predominance of males back in 94. Now it's four to one. <clears throat> but I find this interesting. They, they initially said the, it was rare. Uh, it occurred two to five times per 10,000. Uh, and nowadays we, we, we see it differently. The other thing they, they talked a great deal about was a genetic predisposition to autism uh, by looking at monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And uh, at that time they said there's no cure and there's many therapies out there. Let's look at 2019. I think the consensus is that it's restricted communication and interaction that the patient has and repetitive restrictive actions and behaviors. Uh, I, that seems to be what we're seeing fairly consistently. But what I found fascinating uh, was that we now recognize one in 40, one in 50, one in 100 presence. And you have to ask why this change? And uh, I'll be, I think you and I could probably dialogue about that part of it. Uh, my gut feeling is that we are more aware of it we are more sensitive to the subtle ways that it presents. Uh, we, are, we now use the word autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it doesn't, it's not like appendicitis that it kind of looks this way all the time, every time, 100% or 99% of the time. 
in looking at my notes from my book, one of the things I came across was some margin notes where a friend of mine and I were talking about one of our anesthesiologists that we worked with regularly. We think he's, we think he's, he, he's got an autism spectrum diagnosis mm -hmm. waiting there to, to be made. I think that's an interesting point, though, because what, and obviously I have no medical background, but what we've observed is that the spectrum has just gotten longer and, and, and wider. More, more. So that many of the, the behaviors, medical problems that were difficult to put a label on, now they just put them on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. and, and then in our case, we had a high functioning Asperger, uh, thank God, mm -hmm. who, was, who was high functioning, had certain gifts, but still has autism. I mean, he still is socially uh, uncomfortable. And that will always be the case. And the same thing for my friend who, who's an anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. He is not, he does not socially interact well with anything other than one person and a cup of coffee. Yeah. Does he have a special gift? Well, obviously he does. He, he's very good at he's what he does. He's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he really is. Because isn't that another one of the characteristics that is, not in all cases, clearly, but it's music or math or some other skill where they develop super, almost supernatural uh, abilities, competencies in those skills. A ab absolutely. Uh, when I need anesthesia, if he's ever around, if he's yeah. still around, he, I'm going to be asking for him. My, my grandson can quote every Shakespearean play, every scene, every role. If someone misspeaks, says a line incorrectly, he knows, he'll call them on it. It's incredible. So your grandson is not somebody who does not interact with the world. He interacts with the world in his own way. That's correct. At a level that is higher than most other people That's can correct. imagine. And, and he has come to accept himself. Yes. He understands the difficult, no, he understands how he is different from others. Difficulty is the wrong word. How he is different from other people. Thank you, yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Huh. Uh, well, we've come a long way. You've treated children and adults with autism, I assume. Yes. Do you treat them differently? Uh, you, do I treat children and adults differently? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any way that I can describe how I treat patients generically mm -hmm. in the sense each one is an individual, and if you're a good doc and you're trying to do the things right for your patient, you're going to try to key in on all the cues, both obvious and subtle, that the patient sends to you. Uh, we're all different, and uh, it, it's the duty of the caring physician to tailor themselves mm -hmm. to their, you've got to be aware of their needs and their special needs, and we all have special mm -hmm. needs. And a, a good physician is going to cue in on that. Uh, uh, my friend, uh, the, the, the physician, uh, here's a good example. We, we speculate about it. We, no one's ever did a formal testing. There's all sorts of testing tools for yes. it. Uh, we speculate about it, but when you get to that level of, of a process, I treat him just like I would treat his need. Well, it's, what we've learned, not just from our experience with uh, our grandson, just living, I'm not sure what's normal anymore. Exactly. All, all of us are a little quirky. Uh, my father used to say, we all have a limp, and some of us, you can see it when we walk. <laughs> I love it. That's great. I love that. You know, when, when I do a search, when I, the first time I did a search on autism, uh, it, it invariably, there's a, some reference to the fact that autism is caused by vaccinations, the MMR vaccine particularly. And I know that debate was raging when we found out that our grandson had it, and his mother and father at the time really started to look into that to get as much scientific information as they could and medical opinions, is that likely to have been at least a contributory factor? It was never, ever resolved. Uh, it, has it been resolved in today? Because there was that landmark study, uh, Wakefield, I think it was, mm -hmm. in 1998 study. in Lancet. Yeah, and said categorically there is no link between vaccinations and any form of autism. Well, that was, uh, that was Wakefield uh, wrote a paper in 98 that, uh, that he, that, uh, in which he alluded uh, to the fact that there was a link he had found he could demonstrate in eight patients 
a link between MMR vaccination and autism. And uh, he went further in a press conference that he did two days before uh, Lancet, publi Lancet published his study in which he came right out in front of the cameras and said, no doubt about it, autism is caused by the MMR trivalent vaccine. Uh, I, uh, uh, I don't think there's any linkage at all between uh, the vaccination, mm -hmm. MMR or other ones, and uh, the presence of any preservatives back when we used preservatives. Mm -hmm. I don't think the science supports that. Uh, I think that uh, there's been a lot of solid science that, for me, convinces mm -hmm. me that there is no link. One of the challenges we have, Vince, I think, is what, the what, what, Wasn't his study tainted? Oh, it's horribly tainted. Because he was paid by the pharmaceutical companies? Uh, he there, was, was, there was a grant of some kind? Uh, he was uh, Wakefield. Wakefield, uh, yes. Wakefield received uh, 800, 000, at least $800,000 uh, for the study from a personal injury lawyer named Barr in mm. England. And the eight subjects that he looked at, he, he worked for Barr two years before he did the study. The eight patients that he looked at had been patients not of uh, Wakefield, but had been clients of Barr as a personal injury lawyer who were trying to make a case against the, against the vaccine Russian. manufacturers. Uh, uh, this was a scandal. When he published his paper, uh, initially, it got a lot of news in the press, especially when you go out and two days before the paper yes. hits uh, the presses, you go out there and you have a news conference about it. And many of the physicians around, you know, were skeptical because their experience had been that of, you know, the epidemiology studies suggest there's no correlation. Uh, and uh, the, the physicians and science in general, uh, we tend to be a bit handicapped in that we carry with us the expectation that no one is going to fake data. We can be fooled. Yeah. Uh, fraudulent data will fool us every time. And that turns out, that was what it turned out to be when people did a deep dive on his material. Uh, as, as you know, uh, there is a, there's a reluctance to throw things at people. Uh, to accuse people of things. Uh, the, the, and like the, any profession, don't they close ranks when when they are under attack? Oh, yeah. We, every profession does that, exactly. and physicians are no different. Yeah. But in the, the, there's a reluctance to, to really call him out about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, the British Medical Association uh, took away his practices to his privilege to practice medicine in the United Kingdom. Couldn't it be anything worse than that? No, uh, and uh, it was it was publicized. They published a four-part series in the British Medical Journal about mm. it. They likened uh, Wakefield's original presentation to the Piltdown hoax, where people manufactured a missing link, and his data was completely manufactured. Now, I guess I shouldn't be too surprised at this. You know, you have enough birthdays, you see all sorts of human behavior. <laughs> uh, just the other day, uh, I read where there was a cardiology professor from Harvard who had 31 articles retracted. Yes, mm. because he made up the data. Mm -hmm. uh, why do people do these things? I don't know. Is, is that because, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but is that because there is pressure, always pressure, to, to publish to publish, to publish, to establish your brand and perhaps the hospital with which you're associated mm -hmm. or the group with which you're associated. And so it's marketing, marketing, marketing. Also, it's getting grants, getting grants, yeah. and getting grants. Uh, I've Many academic institutions, one of the expectations is when you are doing research, you need to be bringing in grant money. And if there are, there are some things that are popular for grants right now. Mm. Stem cell research, which is where he yes. fabricated his uh, his information from, get those grants from the NIH. Yeah, doctor, you have to do a show on stem <coughs> cell. Uh, that's we I don't, again. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but we have some experience with that as well. There's so much misinformation about stem cell and what it can do and what it what it can't do. 
as much as they try to couch the language when they make a presentation. But again, I, 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 the, the recent outbreak in uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, measles, uh, as I understand it from the newspaper account, it was speculated at any rate that one of the reasons is that parents were reluctant to have their children uh, vaccinated. Is that a holdover from and a consequence of this continuing debate about whether vaccinations are a contributory factor? I think that or is, is it just negligence on the part of parents? I, I'd never say a parent is negligent. Sometimes they are, but I, I think in general, one of the things that happens is we love our children. We want what's best for them. And there's a lot of information out there that doesn't sustain closed inspection. Now, uh, this past year, uh, World Health Organization identified a concept they called vaccine hesitancy mm -hmm. as causing many problems, in particular one of, wh one of which is uh, measles. Uh, the, uh, about 2016, prematurely, the World Health Organization and the CDC declared the United States measles free. Now, that's, uh, that was very premature, but our data lags a lot on epidemiologic studies. Uh, we went from being measles-free and uh, having, you know, virtually ended measles, which is not a benign disease. Uh, forgive me, for, I don't, I don't want to sound condescending, but I've taken care of kids with measles, and it always scares me. Uh, one in a thousand children with, with measles will get uh, encephalitis. 15% of them die. Worldwide, 100,000 people, according to the World Health Organization, will die from measles in a year. Mm. So this is not a benign process. Uh, the reason why, why parents, I think, are reluctant to have their children receive vaccinations, I think it varies from parent to parent. I have an, I have an in-law who refused to have her children vaccinated. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking to her, and it's not that she doesn't love them. She's mm. passionate about them, but there's there's a little skepticism of organized medicine. Yes, but when our and again this was a hundred years ago, but when our children were uh, when they were born, before they left the hospital, they re received certain vaccinations. Mm -hmm. It was just part of the protocol. And we still now hepatitis. Uh, we still give a hepatitis yeah. vaccination. Yes, uh, at birth too. And mm -hmm. uh, you'll see in, in, uh, in one of the slides you're going to see that uh, we, uh, we don't give uh, uh, the pertussis vaccine. That's the DPT, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it's an mm -hmm. acellular pertussis What's vaccine. What's that? Uh, it's, for, it's for diphtheria, tetanus, and oh. pertussis. And pertussis is whooping cough, which in very mm -hmm. little children is not a benign disease. Uh, because of this vaccine reluctance, yes. we're seeing pertussis is spiking up now, and it kills children. Uh, Haemophilus influenza. When I was growing up in emergency medicine, there's many things you lived in terror of, and one of them was making a mistake. The other thing was, was making the diagnosis and making the diagnosis of uh, acute epiglottitis in a little one. Uh, where so what the, is that? It's, it's, the epiglottis is a soft tissue cartilaginous thing that kind of hangs over our breathing tube. Mm -hmm. And this gets infected with Haemophilus influenza. And people die from that. Closes then? It closes over. Mm. It, it, abs it absolutely closes down on it. Now, fortunately, I grew up in that time. And I had a couple of children. It's one of the ter most terrifying things you can do is is have a child who's, who's wheezing and is getting duskier all the time and having to intubate them knowing you're going to have one shot to get a tube down. And uh, it's terrifying. And uh, so we have a vaccine now that takes that away. And, uh, but yet still, we, we've, we've had children present, even in this day and age, with acute epiglottitis because mm -hmm. parents chose not to immunize. How do you deal with a parent? In your practice, how do you deal with a parent who says, no, doctor, I, I, my husband and I have discussed it and we don't think we want our child vac vaccinated. We don't want to take the risk. And, and furthermore, we don't know what the long-term effects may be. So it may be okay now, but what about when he or she is 25 or 30 years old? 
I have to respect that they love their children. I have to respect the fact there's that no they, rebuttal other than that. Oh, I no, provide them with, with evidence or something, the, 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 more information I, I, so they I, can make an informed decision. You have to you have to do that, but yeah. you have to start your discussion with. All oh, those guys are real crank. They don't <laughs> believe, they don't they think the earth is flat. I can't do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to turn people off. Uh, just like my sister-in-law, you, you start showing the articles and you talk about it and you try to create the dialogue and get people into that. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the science and a well-expressed explanation of what the epidemiologic yeah. studies are. For example, let me take for a second. Uh, there, the epidemiologic studies have been done. Literally, we have not just a case of uh, watching a hundred or three hundred. We have literally series that are hundreds of thousands of studies, excuse me, hundred thousands of cases where the study looked at children who were immunized with MMR and children who were not immunized with MMR. And we can look at literally hundreds of thousands and you've totaled them all well into the millions. And you look and you see, is there a difference in autism rates one year, two year, five years yes. down the road? And that and if MMR is causing autism, you'd expect to see what? A spike, sure. Spike. And you don't. Now, the nature of the way people do science is that they, the, in science you have to look at the null hypothesis. There's no difference. Can you ever prove the null hypothesis? No. Uh, you can only say there's no evidence to reject it. Mm. Now, 95% of the people, when I say there's no evidence to reject it, well, that's not the same as saying it's safe, is it, Doctor? Uh, uh, are there differences in the efficacy of vaccinations based mm -hmm. on uh, based on ethnic background? Or, I don't know. Or other populations outside it, of the U.S.? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, that's something above my pay grade. Okay. Uh, I, I do... Because with the, from what I've read recently about influenza, mm -hmm. there does appear, appear to be a difference in the susceptibility to influenza oh, absolutely. between the U.S. and Europe, for example. Yes. And therefore, the need for vaccinations and the efficacy of the vaccination. Y yeah, is I mean, that's, this is the population dynamics. And there are locations and groups of people who are more susceptible to a disease than other. Uh, show me the next blue-eyed Scandinavian with sickle cell disease. I mean, we, mm. we all have our own predispositions. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can go down to race and gender, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we see this in, in autism. There's a preponderance of four males to one female. Oh. Well, it's a fascinating subject. Uh, you know, with all the money that's being spent, it's probably not nearly enough. But I, I kind of put it in the same category as, uh, as cancer. With all the money we've spent on cancer, I've asked several people this, and I've gotten, I think, answers from pretty wise people. Why haven't we found a cure? And the answer I've been given is because there's not a single cancer. There are all types of mutations of cancer. Therefore, you might have a little bit of a breakthrough on one of them, but it has no effect on, and there's no corollary between that and another vaccine. Oh, I guess the same is true of people on the autism spectrum. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are cancers that will take a young, healthy person at 19 years of age, something like a geoblastoma, uh, one of form a grade four, excuse me, a grade four geoblastoma, uh, they will be, they have horrible results. We're talking about seven, eight months survival. Mm. There are other illnesses that we label as cancer too, that one round of chemotherapy or two rounds of chemotherapy and this person goes on and lives their life. As I shared with you before, in my time in medicine, I have seen Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma has gone from being a death sentence to having people live their lives from it. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma was, was, had great cure rates, great survival yeah. rates. Uh, it's not the same disease, even though they're both called lymphomas. And the same is absolutely true for autism. Uh, my perception is we have many things we're trying to fix on that. It's not discreet. It is significant spread. One of the saddest things, what I think is one of the reasons why you see people grabbing at things like chelation therapy, right now we can't offer anything for a cure. Yeah, yeah. So 
you know, if you're a loving parent, you got to try stuff for your child. And, you know, maybe it works, yeah. maybe it doesn't. You can't just sit back and do nothing. But let me throw something out, though. Suppose if we do something, we choose not to vaccinate our child. Is that right? Should someone speak for the child? Yes, the child has rights. And if the parents disagree, if the parents think this is a good, healthy thing not to be vaccinated. But, Doctor, how often have we read the stories about people who, are out of religious conviction, will not have their children mm -hmm. taken care of? Absolutely. And these and, are, these and are that the ends tough, up in court. These, these are the tough things in no, these they discussions. they are. They're tough decisions. They are extraordinarily tough. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, too, is that when we choose not to vaccinate our child, we may not just be hurting our child. Uh -huh. We may be hurting the child who can't get the measles vaccine. Yes. Yep. We may be hurting the the child who is under two months of age who has pertussis. First vaccines, you know, I, yeah. I get my child vaccinated. The first vaccine occurs at two months of age for pertussis. But there are children that die from pertussis because they've been exposed to it. This is a fascinating subject because we've been concentrating on, on young people, children. I'd like to do, uh, have a conversation with you about vaccines and so on for the people on the other end of the spectrum, namely people of my vintage, who are encouraged to get the shingles vaccine and the flu vaccine and different types of flu vaccine, et cetera, et cetera, and whether or not that's worth the trip. But that's a conversation for another time. That, that is How, a, how's the book coming? Oh, uh, I'm learning stuff all the time. Number one, I need to write better. What's the title of the book again? <laughs> U.S. Healthcare, Dancing Beneath the Diamond Skies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, need to get, I need to work better. I need to write better. And uh, I had a friend in the Israeli Air Force, and the colonel said to me one time, he said, Frank, you know that better is the eternal enemy of done. And yes, uh, as a writer, yes. Uh, it absolutely is. I, I, I agree. Uh, you, you, pick up the, you pick up a chapter and you read it and, yes. oh, I've got to redo this. What are some of the other topics that you have in mind for the series you're going to be doing here at Radnor Studio 21? Well, with the help of my friends, there's a couple topics that I think I like to share with people. I like to talk about Medicare for all. Mm. Uh, very charming idea. Isn't that called universal health care? Uh, it's called a lot of things, depending <laughs> on what part of the political <laughs> spectrum you fall on. But uh, universal health care, Medicare for all. The concept that I generically think of it as there is one provider of health care mm. and variance on that. And that's going to be a fun discussion. Um, the other thing I like again, depending upon which side you are, on I don't. Think, I never hope to give people answers. I just hope to get them. No, talking. I didn't mean you personally. Oh yes. yeah. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I, I, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are some myths in medicine that I'd like to talk about. Things that we feel very comfortable. Give me one. Oh, if I, I if I go out and stand in the rain and I get really cold and chilly, I'm going to catch cold or pneumonia. I did it this morning. I walked out to get the paper. I, I didn't realize how, how wild the wind was, and I was cold. Yeah. I walked out of my shirt, and I, it occurred to me, you're going to catch cold. It doesn't necessarily no. follow. The only thing it? you may get from the cold air is you may start to cough a lot. I did. Uh, you get a little bit of bronchospasm, and you yeah. get a little bit of bronchorrhea. Yeah. Where you're put, but you may have that, uh -huh. but that's not how you catch pneumonia. Give me another myth. Uh, let's see. If I... What if I'm looking at a patient and he tells me he's allergic to penicillin? Huh. What do you think the chances are that patient has a penicillin allergy? I believe the patient, 100%. I tend to do that all the time and every time. But in truth, there's been studies for the last 40 years really? that show it's about 10% accurate when you do skin No testing. kidding. I have to yes. tell my wife that because yes. she's, she always says she's been allergic to penicillin for as long as she's been on the planet. And she may well be. Yeah. It would be worth doing the skin testing yeah. because that precludes you from getting a lot of good well, drugs. Now, let me throw you out something else about, about this. We're talking about... You, you have 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Okay, the other thing... No, save it for the next show. How's that? Hey, I like that. There you save go. it for the next show. <laughs> Thank you very Always much. Always a pleasure, Vince. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, this has Thank been the first installment of The Doctor's In with Dr. Frank Spidell. Until next time, take very good care of yourselves.